So someone sent me in, uh, who has come to the group previously, a question to answer, maybe to upload to YouTube. The question is basically, what do you think the purpose of the ego is? What's the purpose of the ego? And it's quite a long question. Okay, I'll try and answer that. What do I feel is the purpose of the ego? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. For me, uh, the way the question is framed... Um, okay, I can, I can answer that question, even the way it's framed. And for me, the, the ego is a... There's many ways of looking at that question. But the way I, and I could answer it in many different ways, but I think the purpose of the ego, the ego creates for me suffering on a regular basis. Because when I'm in the ego, mm, one of the great things with the ego is it feels a sense of fear and separation. So it's always looking to the world to find a solution so it can be out of fear and separation. So let's say uh, I used to be like um, a compulsive overeater, I used to have a food addiction problem. So it'd be like, if I'm feeling fear and separation or feeling some kind of discomfort, then the ego will say, oh, okay, well, let's have some food to get a, a, a sense of comfort. Or my ego might say, well, let's get a more successful career or let's get a partner or something will then ease. Let me sort of find a way to control the world or do a pattern or go to an old behavior to get some comfort. So I think... Um, one of the things with uh, the ego is it, you always end up trying different routes to get to happiness and usually often at some point finding that they don't work. So I think it's a great, the, on a spiritual level you could say the ego is a great thing because usually spiritual seekers end up pursuing what I call our externals. Uh, the Course in Miracles are called the false gods. All the gods of time and all the transitory things in this world that you can chase the false gods, so choosing whatever they, they are and then getting them and then eventually finding out that they haven't delivered on the thing that one was hoping. So I think the purpose on a spiritual level is that it keeps trying things and then it fails and eventually gets into pain. And then <clears throat> it seeks a, a spiritual solution to trying to alleviate. So it's a great mechanism, I think, for people to wake up spiritually to find a, to be called by the spirit, to transcend the old mechanisms that the ego employed, um, to try and find, um, you know, peace and happiness in the world. And it carries on the question, in A Course in Miracles, it seems the ego is a mistake brought about by a dream of separation, which arose out of a mad idea from the Son of God in which suffering is a result of the original guilt projected outwards onto the world in order to hide from God. Eckhart Tolle talks about the ego as being not wrong but merely unconscious and necessary for the evolution of consciousness. Um, okay. Although this leaves me wondering why it would be this way. I've heard you say, as many spiritual people seem to, that the world can be thought of as a school of transcendence. Yes, I have said that. Um, I've heard Alan Watts say something about the physical world being a place for the universe to recognize itself. I'm not quoting him well, but I think that's the gist. I'm really, in, I'm really interested in what you think. Why would an eternal loving consciousness not simply manifest a perfect eternal physical world? Oh, I like this bit. Mm. Why would an eternal loving consciousness not simply manifest a perfect eternal physical? And there's lots of mm. questions in there. But, you know, for me, like, um, I was talking a, a little bit earlier in this place about having a white light spiritual experience, being in a place of infinite love, power and love. It's like... The intensity of the light and the love is so great that dualis duality, what I mean by duality is separation or this and that can't exist because the light's just too intense. If you were in a place, if, if you had a white light experience, spiritual experience and you came back into this world and you said, well, can shadows exist there? I mean, it would be nonsense. You know, a shadow or a this and a that can't exist at that level of light. So you'd have to, try, you'd have to identify with form 
for this uh, experiencing of separation to exist? So it's a really nice question. So why would an eternal loving, well, if it's eternal, you know, it tends to indicate it's something beyond the world of separation. So like for an infinite, for, an in, for something that's at a level of infinite light and love and power, uh, for it to create something, well, it wouldn't create anything. It would just remain in this place of just timeless, infinite love. Uh, and there wouldn't, in order for there to be separation existing, it would have to come down. And actually, uh, why wouldn't it create a perfect world? Um, so, why would internal love and consciousness not simply manifest perfect eternal, oh, and eternal physical world? That's interesting. Well, for me, the, uh, my view on the physical world is that, so you can be, when the spirit is attached to the body, the physical body, it's a great thing. Uh, that's why I think this is like a, a great school, because when you've got a, when you, when uh, spirits are attached to physical body and you're doing spiritual work, in a physical world you can have people at diverse levels of consciousness all in the same world. Like I could walk down this street, leave this place, and walk down the street, and I might bump into Buddha, who's at a very very high level of spiritual development, and then like two minutes later I could meet like an axe murderer you see, all on the same street. And I think when you've got a physical, you can have people, it's very easy for consciousness or, or the universe to have a place where there's uh, what is called a maximal opportunity for spiritual development in, 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 in a lifetime. Because if, 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 if I was out of body, uh, my understanding is that uh, in this, while attached to this physical body, I can do a lot of spiritual work and I can meet people at very low levels of consciousness, and I can meet inspiring people who have high levels of truth, and I can transcend a lot of the stuff, all the patterns and the thoughts and the unforgiveness within my ego in one lifetime. But when, you know, for me, out of body, um, the spirit tends to eventually congregate with other spirits at the same level. So like, uh, like for me, like a heavenly plane, which is like a level of consciousness, like, you know, like everyone's at a level of love. So there won't be that great a development for spiritual growth. Because if, you know, like in, let's say, heaven, where if everyone's calibrating at love or unconditional love, there's not much of a chance to spiritually grow. It's like everyone's nice to you all the time. So how can you forgive anyone? Like if everyone's perfect all the time, how are you going to forgive anyone if you've got stuff to forgive or let go of? Or if, if one is in um, a dark place, you know, out of body in a dark place, uh, traditionally called hell, or oh, there are many hells, anyway, so then it's like everyone's just horrible, or you haven't got many people teaching how to, like, forgive, or whatever down there. So it's not, you're not going to sort of get a great opportunity necessarily to grow so much. So I do feel like... Um, uh, so, why would an eternal loving consciousness not simply manifest a perfect eternal... Well, I think that is the thing, you know, like, I mean, I think the word physical, I think the word physical is probably, um, because, you know, the fields of uh, the heavenly planes, even though they might not be physical in terms of physical bodies, would be something very close to a dualistic experiencing of the world, but in a more, in a more heavenly field. So, that, that, so you could say it does exist. And this plane in physical bodies does exist with uh, a great variance, a uh, great opportunity for lessons from the worst to the best exist. And you could say that there are planes where it's very, very dark, you know, the hellish planes. And so, oh, okay, so why, why has this even occurred? Well, I think um, if, when manifestation occurs, I think the best way to sort of see it is like when duality occurs, um, there's a freedom in the way it unfolds. Uh, and um, for, for life to exist, for separated life to exist, the contrast is, contrast is needed. You know, to experience, to, to experience light, dark must exist. To experience a lovely person, to be able to experience that, one would have had to have experienced an unlovely person. So, to go from deep despair to great joy, there has to be contrast. If there was no contrast, then 
no separation could exist. There would just be the field of love and light, and that would be just be it. So why didn't, um, so, I mean, yes, I mean, I think she was referring to uh, Eckhart Tolle and Alan Watts and the different ways of describing it. So, uh, you know, I think all of these things, you know, you could go with, you know, could say like, if what, if, um, let's say, let's say God is a thing, a God is that infinite light and love, in order to experience uh, the opposite of God, then maximum separation and fear would need to be existed. And then the journey back to experiencing, returning back to the infinite love would then be possible. So, um, so that's the way to say it. You know, the thing is why, I think why is a really not, not a good question. It's like, why is a plant green and not blue? Or why, why, why are donuts brown? You know, I mean, it's like when things happen, that's just the expression. That is the expression. It's not, it's not a why. That's like how things unfold. So I think those questions are more like mischievous ego questions. Like, why is the colour of the Course in Miracles book blue and not green? I mean, it's like, you know, it's like those are just what they are. So how does something not of God, the ego, come into creation when God is not when God is not real I mean well God is real I mean the ego is not real the world of manifestation is not real whereas the course says that uses the word illusion we're, in a, we're an illusion it's an illusion an illusion of fear and separation so we're we're removing the blocks to love the infinite love so so how does something not of God the ego come into creation when God is not when when the ego is not real, not God is not real. How does something not not of God come to? Well, you know, I'd like to sort of sort of frame it in this way from my own experience, from having a white light spiritual experience. Separation exists as soon as identification occurs. So, if I, you know, if my if there was no identification with thought, with this body, with any contrast in this world, if I had. If I'd applied the course, just the first lesson, one of the first lessons of Course in Miracles is my thoughts are meaningless, my body is meaningless, uh, that plant is meaningless, all the people in this world, this whole world is meaningless. If I render them meaningless, then they cease to exist. And if everything ceases to exist, then there's just the infinite love of God. That, that, that's like my experience. But as soon as something is identified with thoughts or bodies or ideas or this and that or people, or whatever, then the world exists. So how does something not of God? So it, in my experience, it comes together through identification. These are all things that the Course uses. Well, I use the word identification, but when, when something has meaning, if a thought has meaning, then suddenly it's like a individuated mind can exist. If the body has meaning, then suddenly the experiencing of body exists. When something is rendered meaningless, it starts to disappear and then almost like doesn't exist. You know, like uh, in the early days, I spent a lot of time making food meaningless. So it'd be something that's not important. And then eventually, you know, like, if you make something, like if you've got a problem with money, if you've got a problem with food, if you've got a problem with the relationship or anything, they, they're only problems because your ego makes them meaningful. When they're rendered, or, or when they're rendered unmeaningful, at a certain point, they no longer exist for you. Like, you know, like, um, so when you do spiritual work, um, then these things disappear. Like, everyone sort of knows this idea of when, um, like, I, I started to live outside a tube track, the Piccadilly line, and the train was passing by on a day, and, and people would come in and sort of say, how could you live here with that noise going on every few minutes? But after a while, I didn't even hear the noise became like meaningless to me. I didn't even know that people would come and say, look, that noise. I go, oh yeah, I didn't actually hear that noise. So you can make donuts meaningful, meaningless, you can make this whole world, and then it start, ceases to exist. So that's the way, so how does something not of God come into creation? That's how, for me, creation comes into existence. Uh, how could a mad, unloving idea be generated from love? Well, some, is, you know, so, if, if the absolute is infinite love and light, 
then for, for contrast to exist, like uh, an opposing thing has to come into existence for there to be, to experience separated life, um, not just the oneness, the infinite love of God forever, eternally, then for the idea of a separated life to be born, then there has to be contrast. So it just has to birth. And for that, the experiencing of contrast then has to come through, through what level of contrast, um, through whatever identification that has. You know, like if someone has done a lot of spiritual work, they're probably in a blissful, peaceful place most of the, most of the time. If someone's got a lot of like uh, addictions, lots of resentments, lots of grievances, lots of stuff going on, lots of fear within them, they're going to experience a lot of discomfort and separated states uh, generated from them. So, like I was saying, when there's identification, it's like out of the light comes darkness. It, and the darkness is an illusion. It's not really like when, when something dies from a, from a certain point of view, the eternal nature within us never dies. It's just what dies was the illusory idea of a separated self that thought it was alive and then thought it could die. And it's recognized with the final ego death, you know, which enlightened teachers talk about, it's realized that the thing that died was in separation. And then the thing that's in separation, i.e. the ego, the body-mind, when it dies doing spiritual work, it's born, to the, it's born to this eternal recognition that it could never die. Hence, I, always, I think this is the right uh, point to describe what St. Francis said. It's in dying one is born to eternal life. So if you do spiritual work and kill the ego off, uh, like enlightened teachers have done, then your ego dies, but then you recognize a place that cannot die, which is your true, true nature. So the ego thing that you thought you were was the illusion, but your, your true nature can never ever die. So how could a mad idea generated from love then bump up against the realization that this can't really be understood on a conceptual level. And I have to trust my experiences of love, peace, connection when my mind is quiet. Yes, I agree with that. But my ego, whoops, oh, I lost my place. Oh, there we go. But my ego pops up with the reductionist, materialist idea that such a state could merely be a byproduct of brain physiology. I read a scientific paper the other day suggesting this. Well, you know, some scientists, uh, the thing that breaks down the idea of, will help people who are too much into the scientific thing, you know, the you know, a lot of scientists are what are called Newtonian, which they believe that this causality is real, like this causes that. If a billiard ball hits this ball, it'll move off in that direction. And therefore, there isn't like an, there isn't a God. And the Heisenberg principle, which is talked a lot about by spiritual, a lot of spiritual teachers, was the experiment that actually, you know, if, if phenomena are observed, if a scientist observes phenomena at an atomic level, the phenomena are changed between waves and particles. So just by witnessing something, just if, a, if someone is just watching or observing a thing, then whether it becomes atom, whether it becomes waves or particles shifts. So this then means that actually the, there isn't this idea by scientists in the past that, which is starting to change with things like quantum physics and the Heisenberg principle, that uh, this causes or that. Actually it's not. There is a consciousness. Even human consciousness changes the outs of what's happening in the world. Then what about the consciousness of God? Then you'd realize that actually God, at infinite consciousness, is actually the absolute creator of everything that happens in the world. And this idea that uh, this causes that, and that that's not an infinite presence out of which things um, are created, is actually the way to go. So scientists are starting slowly to recognize that, even though it's probably still early days. So, um, yeah, thanks for that great question.